Small businesses are still struggling. There are 30% fewer businesses open today than before the pandemic and their revenues are down 50%. The vaccine rollout remains rocky with unstable supply and inequitable unorganized distribution, stalling our progress towards a full reopening. And the economic shutdown has taken its toll on property values. These factors have had real impacts on our budget. One of the most noticeable developments in the preliminary budget was the drop in property tax revenues. For the first time in a quarter century, property tax revenues for the coming year will actually decline. And that led to substantially bigger budget gaps, bringing them to over $6 billion. It was in that context that the mayor introduced his FY 2022 preliminary budget. At $92.3 billion, it's almost $3 billion less than this year's budget. But as we'll see, it's going to grow with the addition of new federal stimulus funds. Non-property taxes, especially the personal income tax and business taxes, have held up better than the property tax. And that's helped offset at least some of those bigger gaps as you can see. Now, why is it that these taxes have come in higher than expected? Well, for one thing, Wall Street has raked in $38 billion in profits in the last three quarters, more than at any time since the bank bailout of 2009. But at the other end of the spectrum, as you can see, in the sectors that were hardest hit by the shutdowns, hotels and restaurants, arts and entertainment, personal services, jobs were still down 37% in December compared to their pre-pandemic levels. And those jobs earn on average less than $50,000 a year compared to over $200,000 for jobs in the sectors least affected. So the most vulnerable among us were made more vulnerable by the shutdowns and the wealthiest among us are doing fine. They still have jobs and they're still making a ton of money. But even though non-property taxes were stronger than expected, there was still a $5.5 billion budget gap that had to be closed in the preliminary budget. So how did the mayor close this gap? 5.5 billion. First, there was an additional savings program of $1 billion, which relies heavily on a hiring freeze, attrition, and on overtime savings. He also drew down $1.15 billion from next year's contingency reserves, leaving just $100 million in reserves for next year. We've refinanced our outstanding debt at lower rates to save another $326 million next year. That's according to the mayor's preliminary plan. I also want to tell you that our office, I work with the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget to realize savings of over $800 million this year and next already. And I do want to take a moment to thank the excellent public finance team here at the Controller's Office for their efforts on this front. Altogether, the lower debt service costs account for over 40% of the citywide savings plan, and I'm proud to have helped achieve this. It was a lot of work but it was critically important to maintain the financial viability of the city. Also, the budget expects that lower pension contributions will save us $300 million next year. And I have to again, thank our office because the early investments in the Bureau of Asset Management to make it more modern and highly professional resulted in a very strong actuarial return for our pension funds. So today I'm proud to announce here that last year, 2020, our pension funds earned over 14%. And through December, the pension funds have earned on average over 9% a year since the beginning of my tenure, well over the target goal of 7%, 9%. I'm very proud of this and I'm very proud of our office. The biggest component of the gap closing program was an additional surplus of $2.7 billion from the current year. Take a look at the slide. Uh, mostly uh, because our income and business taxes have done much better than anticipated. And we did all that, by the way, without laying off any city workers. I said at the time, all those layoff threats to our frontline workers were completely unnecessary. And I want us to take a look at this. But let me just say, just because we closed the FY22 gap doesn't mean we don't have work to do to get our own fiscal house in order for the future. It's important to remember that even when our economic recovery is fully underway again, we will still face substantial budget gaps into the future. 
And there are risky assumptions in the mayor's budget that mean the gaps could be even larger than expected. Some assumptions that are, I'm worried about is the unrealistic assumptions about overtime spending, our, our underestimating the cost to place students with special needs in appropriate education settings. Uh, these are some of those assumptions. The state budget pr uh, troubles present additional challenges. Take a look at this. As many of you know, over the past five years, the state has already pushed $1.3 billion in costs onto the city. This year's budget would cut back 800 million in state education funds, substituting federal funds from December stimulus bill instead. Uh, and plus there would be another 200 million, 220 million in other costs that we should be concerned about. The state's long-term budget prospects could leave us facing even bigger shortfalls in the future at a time when we will need to make investments to build the new economy of our city. We must do work here at home too. We simply cannot continue with business as usual. Now, you know me for years, I've highlighted areas where we continue to spend hundreds of millions of dollars year after year without proven results. So we have our watch list as we always uh, usher in with our budget presentation. I wanna start with homelessness. The homeless crisis in our city is heartbreaking. It is frustrating, but we're spending $3 billion a year on homelessness, twice as much now as we did seven years ago. But what's really changed? Not much. Single adult shelter population that's reached an all time high of 20,000 New Yorkers. And what is very disturbing, despite this huge spend, more than 21,000 of our children will sleep in a shelter tonight. 21,000 children. It is unacceptable to continue spending more than $3 billion a year and not making a measurable difference for New Yorkers in crisis. We have got to double down on the shelter conditions on the money that is not actually impacting this crisis, and we have to put more attention to this. Let's take a look at correction. I've put this on our agency watch list uh, most years. We're still spending, now we're spending $400,000 a year to incarcerate one person on Rikers Island, 400,000. While violence in uh, Rikers continues to climb, this is unacceptable and we have to drill down on this. We've got to redirect resources to programming and treatment that can help prevent incarceration and reduce violence within the jails. We have to help people succeed in their communities after they leave. The costs here, both human and financial, are huge. Uh, and I also think that uh, we're spending $200 million a year on a mental health program, Thrive, uh, with little accountability, with little data or outcomes to show progress. The spending must be evaluated and agencies must be held accountable for producing measurable results. So homelessness, correction, mental health, these are the buckets that we have to pay special attention to. As I've said for years, this is not acceptable spending when there are no results and we have to be smart about how we budget. Now, there is some good news, which is that we will have federal stimulus funds coming in. Uh, this is gonna give us the much needed resources to help our families, jumpstart our economy, and to lay the groundwork for a better future. The same morning that the mayor released his preliminary budget, we got word that the Biden administration was gonna pick up 100% of our eligible COVID disaster relief spending. And that's worth an estimated $1 billion in extra funding. And Congress is currently working on President Biden's proposed America Rescue Plan, which includes $350 billion in aid for hard-pressed states and local governments. The House plan would allocate $5.6 billion to New York City. That is very crucial. Now, whatever the final number is, let's remember, even with this wonderful uh, stimulus, important stimulus, stimulus money is temporary. It will give us some help this year and next, maybe even a little the year after that, but after that, it's gone, gone. And we need to strategically use these federal funds to relieve the suffering of New Yorkers. We need these funds to jumpstart our economic recovery, to lay the groundwork for a new fairer economy. This is our moment to do that. And doing that will be the best use of those one-time stimulus funds. It's gonna position us to stand on our own two feet because when the money is gone, we are gonna need to have built a better future for New Yorkers. We must use the FEMA reimbursement money to help families who are still struggling through this pandemic and to give our economy the shot in the arm it needs to bring back jobs for the hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers who are still without one. Now, families 
are hurting and they're anxious. Even with unemployment benefits, they're falling behind on rent. They're struggling to feed their families. We must make sure that getting the help they need is our priority. We must cancel rent for the hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers who have fallen behind through no fault of their own. Remember, the economy shut down all around them and they were left without any money. And we must ensure that every New Yorker, regardless of immigration status, and let me say that again, regardless of immigration status, has access to the benefits and support they need during the pandemic. Now, two weeks ago, I called for a $25 million emergency food program for New Yorkers left out of the federal and state safety net programs. Now we have the funds. We've got to feed every family and we got to get it right and we have to do it well. Let me continue. Uh, we must invest in our schools. We got to ensure that they're able to operate full time next year. Many of them will need new ventilation systems, air purifiers and other modifications. And we will need programs to address the learning loss and emotional trauma of the past year. We have to recognize that a lot of our children lost their moms and dads who were frontline workers. A lot of kids haven't had closure. They're going to have issues. I see it with my own public school kids. They're going to need help. And we've got to make sure that we're building that mental health foundation now. And that's why this money is so critical. I also think that it's time to bring justice to the thousands of taxi medallion owners and drivers who are crushed under a mountain of debt. And I mean crushed. Many have been forced into bankruptcy already. We can bring all the parties together and solve this problem before it even ruins more lives. That is something that we need to do. And I want to talk about how we need to help jumpstart our economy. More than 2,800 small businesses closed this summer, and that number has only grown in the months since. If they don't reopen, hundreds of thousands of unemployed workers will not have jobs to go back to. So we must use those extra federal funds to help businesses reopen and to give our economy the boost it needs this spring. Millions of square feet of retail space currently sit unused, and we've got to give retailers tax breaks for locating in high vacancy corridors throughout the city. We need a robust small business plan tied to relief financially, but also a forward thinking plan for the future. We got to help our struggling restaurants with the tax credits or grants until it's possible for them to fill their seats with customers again. And that's a combination of, of making sure we have inoculation, testing, but we also need to help out uh, financially. Uh, also, I want to mention that we know that there are thousands of workers in small firms that support Broadway and the performing arts. They help with costumes and sets and everything else that goes into a performance good paying jobs. These are good union jobs. They need help surviving until Broadway and other performance venues can reopen again. We need a robust program to keep them afloat until we're able to go back inside. But most of all, we need to ensure that all New Yorkers have equitable and easy access to vaccines. And without that, there is no recovery. The vaccination is the key. And these are the kinds of ideas we need now to take advantage of those federal dollars and get our people back to work uh, and to open our city for business again. Uh, those are our immediate needs and we can use stimulus funds to help meet these challenges. But while the next round of stimulus funds can provide the down payment to start building a new economy, we cannot reopen the economy the same way we closed it. We have got to think differently. The new economy we build must be fairer and more just with benefits that are more widely shared and that helps right some of the historic wrongs of the past. For that, we will need new investments, investments in new affordable housing for the lowest income households who are on the brink of eviction and homelessness, investments to rebuild NYCHA, the best affordable housing resource that we have. We must invest in childcare so that tens of thousands of parents mostly women can rejoin the workforce knowing their children have safe quality care. Investments in healthcare to correct the inequities in access and outcomes that the pandemic made so glaringly obvious. I saw it firsthand and talked to doctors when my own mom was dying of COVID in the Bronx. We cannot continue to manage people's illnesses. We must solve some of these challenges. We also have to invest in public safety to end the criminalization of poverty and mass incarceration and move us to a new public health focused model 
investments in transit so that every New Yorker can move easily from home to work to school and back, no matter what their zip code, no matter what their borough. This is the way we rebuild a new city. We need investments to restore our neighborhoods and make streets safe and friendly for walking and for biking. This is the moment to do that. We also need real investments in resiliency for all of our neighborhoods and to build a new green economy for the future of our city and our planet. And not least, investments in workforce development to give New Yorkers the skills they need in the post-pandemic recovery. And for these investments, we will need new resources and new revenue streams. That's why I support the Invest in Our New York City agenda in Albany. We can use stimulus funds to start these new investments because we must act now and take advantage of the moment. But in order to carry them forward, let's not be short-sighted. We're gonna to have to identify revenue streams, steady, stable revenue streams to transform our amazing city. We have reached this crucial moment in the extraordinary history of the COVID-19 pandemic and the great lockdown. And we can start seeing light at the end of the tunnel. I believe that we can't go back to the status quo. That wasn't working before. The pandemic is not going to create a new economy and a new opportunity unless we take hold of it. This is the challenge before us, the challenge to create a new, better New York with more opportunity, justice, and fairness. I do think this is the time to seize the moment. We're gonna to have to have all hands on deck. Everyone's gonna to have to get around the table. We're gonna to have to have real discussions, real strategic thinking. You can't just throw money at a problem. You need to be strategic. You need to change systemic the systemic challenges we face, and I believe we can get there. Uh, I've been honored to uh, work with all of you over the years and looking at the city budget. For me, uh, this presentation is a little, um, I don't know, uh, kind of the end of uh, uh, a very intense role is controllers relates to the budget, but I'm happy to be with all of you today. And I do want to thank the controller's office for all the incredible hard work and especially Preston Niblack, who has been such a great uh, deputy controller for budget. And with that said, I'll be happy to take any questions any of you may have. If you raise your hand to ask a question, we can call on you to ask the controller. Your first question comes from Joe Anuda. Good morning, Mr. Anuda. Uh, hi, Mr. Controller. How are you doing? Good, sir. How are you? Uh, not too bad. Um, calling in from uh, Room 9 in City Hall today. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. On a field trip. Um, I was curious. Um, I just think it's interesting. You know, you highlighted the success of Wall Street. And um, I think a lot of that is tied up with the stock market. I'm just curious how you think about, you know, so you have Wall Street, you have these high income earners who kind of didn't seem like they were very affected in the pandemic. You obviously have the lower wage workers in New York who were affected. Um, it seems like that balance is problematic for you, yet at the same time, the financial markets also delivered your good news about the pension system. So, I mean, it, how do you balance those two things? You know, you want the stock market and all your investments that do well for you in the pension systems. But at the same time, I get the sense you, you feel like it's rewarding Wall Street too much at the expense of New Yorkers who, who aren't making that same sort of money. Well, you know, this budget presentation isn't about, you know, you know, reward. This is about letting you know the facts of where we stand. Um, Wall Street did extraordinarily well and the people who are investors did amazingly well. Uh, at the same time, people who were frontline workers, people in low wage jobs really got wiped out because of this economy. And we have to make sure that we go back to our value proposition in this city, which is to create a city that everyone can prosper and everyone can live in. And that means investments in affordable housing, real affordable housing, quality public education, and we also want to make sure that we are a city of great diversity uh, where everyone in the world wants to come here and live. New Yorkers who left, I want New Yorkers to come back. And I also want to start thinking strategically about arts and culture and bringing back the 62 million tourists that are no longer here. And part of what we have to do is think short term about how we get the city up and running. And also what is our long term investments going to be in our city? 
and that is the state of play that I wanted to convey to all of you today. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Next question from Michael Gartland. Hi, hi Michael. Oh, hey, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hey, Mr. Comptroller. Um, so, uh, could you give us a little more detail on how cancel rent would work? Um, what are the, what are kind of the particulars of how that kind of plays out? Well, look, we have uh, buckets of stimulus money and we have to construct a program. I'm not gonna announce a program today, but it's pretty clear to me that we simply can't evict hundreds of thousands of people who have no income. So we have to make them whole. We have to think about the mortgages, especially for small landlords. We have to align with the banks and come up with a financial structure that is going to uh, work for the city. And that is what I'm very focused on. Look, when you think about where we were pre-pandemic, Michael, we had a 3.4% unemployment rate and we had added 970,000 jobs over the previous 10 years. But when COVID hit in March, the unemployment rate went to 20% and those 970,000 jobs, we lost 900,000. So we have to be realistic about where we stand. Now we've gotten a, a number of those jobs back, but the unemployment rate is seriously high. When the stimulus money comes, part of that money must be for a robust program to make people whole in rent and mortgages. Um, can I ask one more question? Yeah. Um, you, you talked about building, a, you know, a foundation for mental health and, you know, at the same time have been critical of, um, the thrive program. How would you go about building that foundation? What do you think, how do you measure success with that too? I mean, that seems to be, you know, kind of a, a tough place to measure success, what would be the measures you kind of like to see put in place? There's a number of measures that experts will use to evaluate whether programs are working and not working. Uh, I will tell you this, that we can't just say we're throwing money at problems without seeing any kind of transparent numbers. As you know, that has been one of the major critiques I've had of the Thrive Program. But look, I think it's now time to deconstruct a bureaucratic program and invest more directly with services, cut through the bureaucracy, get rid of 1-800 numbers. And I do think the best place to start is in the New York City public school system. I am very concerned uh, about the challenges our teenagers and our young kids are going to face as we get out of this pandemic. And again, I said a lot of kids lost their parents, my little kids lost their grandmother, still no closure as to how all this happened. And while we adults know the ramifications of COVID and the lack of investment in communities of color and so many of the obvious challenges we have to rebuilding the city, let's face it, a nine-year-old doesn't know that and a teenager doesn't know that. And yet who is going to be counseling the kids, making sure that we identify early challenges they have. Maybe it's suicide thoughts. Maybe it's just a disengagement in learning because now kids fell farther and farther behind. And I don't think the current mental health programs that are constituted are doing anything to prepare us for September and do that. And I'm saying this now because I'm putting the DOE on notice that they have an obligation to bring forth with con consultation of PTAs and parents and struggling New Yorkers a plan to protect every one of our children. That has to be the most important piece of rebuilding during this pandemic. It's not just what we build brick and mortar, but it's what we build in terms of healthcare and mental health care. Any other questions today? All right, that concludes our presentation. Thank you everybody for listening. Be safe and see you all soon. Thank you.